Hello everyone and welcome to the special NDTV WEF debate coming to you from the World Economic Forum Congress Center in Davos. Our subject, how immune is India? And I guess that has to be further broken up into two parts. How immune is India to the global shocks and the crises that we could be seeing in Europe and in other parts of the world? And uh, a second question as well, perhaps, how immune is India to India and some of the internal problems that sometimes do to plague it. And we have a fantastic panel to take us through all aspects of this. I'd like to start by welcoming uh, Dr. Subhachai Panishpak, who's the Secretary General of UNCTAD. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Anand Sharma, uh, the Minister for Commerce and for Industry, it's great to have you with us uh, once again to tell us what exactly the Indian government can do to, if there's a perception that India seems to be slowing down, what can be done to, to change it. Douglas Peterson, President of Standard Employers in USA, who told me a short while back that India ha is looking rather stable. We're going to get you to tell us why that's, that, that is in fact the case. Baba, Baba Kalyani of uh, Bharat uh, Forge, fantastic to have you with us. Nick Gowing uh, needs very little introduction, main presenter of the BBC. Nick, if I start running out of steam, I'm going to get you to take over at some point in the next one hour or so. Uh, and Barry Eichen Green from the Berkeley University or the University of California at Berkeley, thank you. Uh, you've done a lot of work in emerging markets and, and also where, uh, what India is looking like. We're going to leave this really free flowing as we go forward, but perhaps a couple of lines opening comments from each of you. And Dr. Supachai, I'm going to start with you. How immune is India? Uh, if actually we go by the kind of uh, globalization process that is going on at the moment, I don't think we can say that anybody is immune to any changes in the world today. So uh, even in spite of the fact that uh, India is not really dependent so much on external demand, uh, there will be some implications because India has been opening up the economy, rightly so, in the last couple of years. So India will not be fully immune, but India will have its own cushion. Uh, with the size of uh, domestic demand that India has and also with the kind of the building up of the reforms in the past couple of years, although an unfinished task, but this was then India in good state. All right. Uh, Minister? I think uh, Subhachai has said it. You live in a world which is interdependent, interconnected. We have been talking for more than a decade or so about globalization, and technology has done it, capital flows have done it. So to say that if there is really an earth-shaking development in one part of the planet is not going to impact on others. That would not be the case. The adversity of impact, however, will stand qualified from region to re region. That's primarily because of the macroeconomic fundamentals. In case of India, the macroeconomic fundamentals were and continue to be strong, and the regulatory mechanisms are firmly in place. Though there is some impact, that's the deacceleration, which we saw for a few months, which was very worrisome in manufacturing. But overall, we'll still sustain very high growth rates. And it was the same parameters which had ensured that after 2008-9, it was not the economic crisis only. It was preceded for the first time in the last eight decades, to be precise, or seven and a half by a financial crisis of enormous magnitude which imploded from the right. heart of the capitalist world. But we were able to weather the storm and rebound quickly because and of these fundamentals. you think that's going to happen again this time? Well, I remain optimistic because we are conscious of the challenges, but we are also self-confident that we'll be able to address it, not as a government alone, okay. but in partnership with our industry. Dr. Peterson, I think uh, Standard & Poor's has a rating of BB, BBB minus for India, which is... Uh, better than it could be, uh, perhaps worse than, than it should be at some point. Well, let me start by thanking you for having us here today. Standard & Poor's has a rating of triple B minus on India, which is an investment grade rating and it's stable. As the world changes and there is a, a shifting of economic power and a crisis right now in Europe, while we're here at Davos, the main topic of discussion is the Eurozone, the banking sector, and all eyes are on India to be an engine of growth, of stability. The triple B minus rating comes with a stable factor along with that, in particular because of the factors we heard about of strong domestic demand and domestic growth, stability in the capital markets. But there are many challenges, and I'm sure we'll be talking about those. Okay. Baba Karyani, are you as <coughs> optimistic as all that, or do you think Indian industry seems to be worried. Indian industry in particular has been repeatedly voicing over the last three to four months that things aren't going as well as they would like it to. And I've heard a lot of that in Davos as well. 
first of all, <clears throat> I think you know, no country is immune to uh, these kind of uh, happenings in one part of the world uh, as we live in a highly interconnected world. At the same time, uh, I would like to say that you know, India and the emerging market or countries in emerging markets can't wait for these problems to get solved before they start fixing what needs to be done uh, in their own system. Having said that, I think, uh, and uh, you know, you just heard the Standard & Poor's rating for India, triple B minus stable. The negative part of that rating are factors like inflation, factors uh, where a large portion of our population is outside, uh, let's say, economic activity. And that needs growth. And growth can come provided you start investing in infrastructure, start investing in education, and start creating a transparent system and process so where investors feel comfortable. Right. Nick Kang, uh, I wanted to ask you also about the perception of India because here at Davos, I've, I've seen in 2006 there was India everywhere, even last year there was India inclusive. India perhaps was hyped up more than it should have been a bit, bit too early. Now is the perception pendulum swinging to the other direction? I think this is the interesting contrast between what S&P is saying, that it's essentially stable at that level, whereas the perception is rather different at the moment, certainly for outsiders, whether here in Davos or elsewhere. Certainly, I've detected anxiety, and certainly what you've seen as well among uh, international chief executives. For the first time, India has been downgraded in their minds as a safe place to do business. It reminds me of when I was in India, uh, say, 10 years ago. Those same kind of frustrations are, in perception terms, returning. Well, that's rather worrying. If it's the same sort of perception problems which we had 10 years ago, which we've worked very hard to eradicate, if they are coming back, then it's cause for concern. I don't think so, and I pity those who have that perception. I have consciously used the word pity. Either they are not adequately informed or it has become trendy. If one person or two people say that there are worrisome developments, there is going to be an earth-shaking development in India, and everybody starts talking the same. It shouldn't happen. What is going wrong with us? Uh, I would like people to educate me. When you look at our trade, it's growing. India's two-way trade has grown consistently despite the global contraction since 2008. Last year, we crossed $750 billion only in merchandise trade. That's the, that's the figure, if not but more. the deficit is growing too. No, that's because we don't control the oil prices and the fertilizer prices. 2010, 108 billion India paid for oil and gas imports in a growing economy. The energy security is important. In India, we're making our own effort. We don't know what we are sitting on, the onshore and offshore exploration and the production is increasing. But, but, but this time, from a mean average of 2010 of Brent crude <clears throat> at $60 per barrel, India paid $110 last year. But yet we are not allowing the trade account or the current account deficit to increase. Second okay. thing, we will still grow at 7.5%. Now those who have these alarm bells ringing should look inwards about the governance in their societies, the regulatory mechanisms. I'm not going to point out at regions. The okay. fact is there is no recovery in the developed world. It's jobless recovery. Okay, only, that, that, only US and demand. America are giving some positive signals. So I fail to understand why in Davos, those who come all the way, they have the concern for India. They should have concern domestically too. All India right. can take care of itself, I can assure you. <laughs> all right, Barry, let me, let me get you and then I'm going to get Nick to respond to that. Um, I'm bullish about India as well. I think the economy can grow by 8%, not for a few years, but for a few decades. I think there uh, is the potential for a couple of decades uh, of high growth, not double digit, but high single digit, and not in 2012. I think 2012 is going to be a very difficult year uh, for India because the external uh, environment will be terrible. It will be worse than 2011, and because India has made one big mistake in the run-up to the crisis, it uh, didn't keep its powder dry. It doesn't have any policy flexibility left. If, if the world economy slows down, uh, it can't use fiscal policy. It's been used up. It can't use monetary policy because the inflation problem hasn't been solved. And it is vulnerable because of that 
big current account deficit, it needs finance for the deficit, and it's not clear that banks in the West will be prepared to provide it. All right, they should have kept its powder dry. Nick, uh, pitying the perception that uh, India is actually in, under some sort of stress and countries in the West should look worry about the West and not worry about India? Vikram, I'm simply reflecting what I hear and what I see. I'm an outsider. I go to India an enormous amount. But I've been struck in the last few months by the, the shift in attitude. I've been to many conferences over many years in India, and I've heard the frustrations. I've seen the buoyancy, but I'm reflecting what I hear, particularly yeah. over the 2G scandal uh, from October of 15 months ago, and the impact that has had on the corruption debate, and then Anna Hazara, and the impact on the parliamentary process, the, the, the way confidence in parliament has changed. All these have uh, have added to the problems of perception, along with something like mm -hmm. the sudden U-turn on multi-brand retail supermarkets. Uh, you so may, that's you a may particularly smile. sore subject with the minister out here, who, of course, <laughs> is the person well, who tried I raise it? rather hard to push it through. Well, so I'm going to. But, but I'm talking. For once, he's going to agree with you, Nick. That that you're happened. asking me, and I'm talking about perceptions. Right. Um, I just want to get get you in, uh, Douglas, for a minute before I come back to the minister and and, and also Dr. Subhachar. Is there a shift in perception that you're picking up? Let me uh, mention a couple of the key factors. The, the development of India took a very different path than many other countries in, to the east in, in Asia, the, which had a manufacturing base which started with low-end textiles and moved up the value chain. India has had a phenomenal track record of services economy and moving up that value chain into knowledge work. But there are, the barrier to entry there is education. There are other countries that are getting into that business. Bangladesh and the Philippines are behind that. They're coming in also with an English language service base. So I believe that along with that continued growth and opportunity in those lines, which the reputation is excellent, but with more competition, there are also needs in the agricultural sector for modernization, for figuring out how to make it more productive, more efficient, as well as continuing with growing in the manufacturing sector. So I see that there are, there are strengths, as I talked about before, with the capital markets, the internal growth, but there are also very important development challenges and, and structural changes that need to be made. All right. Dr. Subhachan? Yes. I, 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 I think we need to understand the, uh, uh, the spatial position that India is in. First of all, uh, India is a a successful country in combining, uh, com in combining the openness of the democratic system with the openness of the economic system. If you look in, in at average Asian economy, you would see that most of the time, normal Asian countries would lead their development process by first opening up the economic system, and then later on come back and, and try to open up the democratic system. Now, India, I think, has been successfully carrying out the kind of a combination which is very difficult to, uh, to, to, to execute of an open democratic system with open trading system. Now, it will make the reforms very complicated things, but at least it's a good combination. Secondly, if you look carefully beyond the headlines about India, you would see that uh, India is probably the only country in, in Asia that has a, a deficit on its current account. Mm -hmm. Most of the countries will have surpluses. And I'm not so sure whether a country with surpluses and accumulation of huge reserves, international reserves. Well, that served them well. The reserves uh, mostly uh, invested in dollar-denominated papers, and they are losing in all these reserves anyway. So India is actually trying to generate a kind of domestic demand to build up their productive capacity. And so they've had to run up some deficit. Thirdly, in most countries in Asia, they have definite export-oriented policies. So they all tend to undervalue their currency. Now I look at the way India has been trying to be competitive. They didn't use, they, India is one of the least uh, uh, interventionist countries in, in dealing with exchange rates. India has allowed actually exchange rates to go up and down. And so one of the most challenging, and in the long term, I would say India would have a very much more balanced economy than the rest of Asia. But Dr. Sapachai, what you just referred to, the, the fact that India is one of the few emerging markets like this, especially in Asia, which has such a large deficit, is that perhaps the biggest cause for concern, because as global shocks happen, as we're asking whether India is immune or not, it is the existence of some of those deficits, and I think that's what Barry was referring to as well, which could potentially destabilize the Indian economy. Well, if the price of oil, for, uh, God forbid there's a war between Iran and the USA, the price of oil goes up to 150, that's when you really start getting into problems. 
Well, I, I think, well, the scale of current account deficit that India has to uh, live with at the moment is a little bit on the, on the high side, I would, I would admit that. But you see, this is, this is a global economy. Somebody will have deficit and somebody will have to have surpluses. I, I would not be saying that India is providing a sort of services for the rest of the Asian economy because they are buying things from the, from the rest of Asia. But this is actually a little bit uh, uh, on, on the high side. And so uh, this actually means that uh, while India has been growing rapidly, it means the domestic demand has been increasing rapidly. So India is at a, I would say, a saturated level uh, uh, position. That India would have to do more uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, capital formation and to do more with reforms uh, for a new cycle of growth. To take place. I, I just wanted to ask you what externally, let's say the crisis gets worse in Europe. I must or respond Britain. first to Nick. Oh, you must respond to Nick. Okay. First <laughs> respond to Nick. You see, it's again going back to the perception theory as to what's happening in India. It's what you watch in the media and whether that should shake your confidence in a country, its leadership, its ability, in its people, in its entrepreneurs. It's always fashionable to flow with the trend. I know that there have been challenges which we have faced, but the fact, as Supachai said, that India is a republic, is a functional, constitutional democracy, rule-based and rule-governed. Now, confidence of the rest of the world did not collapse with Enron and Lehman Brothers happening in America, the New Rock and the news of the world in UK, and I can, it's a long list, by the way, so why pick on India? But, but, and at but, least here there have been systems are there to fix them. There was corporate frauds fixed. Let me question those who are asking us, have you had an effective system to fix corporate frauds? But India has the case of Satyam. 24,000 jobs were saved. And there is a long list of those, but half Shana, a million or more, who actually lost. No, I, I'm being, I, I have to be upfront on this. But, but I, I, Shana, listen, the, I, while I admit the challenges that my country faces, at the same time, this virus of corruption, you're talking of 2G, I can name many mother Gs. So this has not erupted in the 2011 in I'm India. I'm not even going to get so, into which no, mother G you might not, be referring I'm to. Not, I'm not going to get into I, that. I could start speculating on various mother Gs, my, but I'm not going to. No, Vikram, it's my duty to be towards restrained. my people. And I speak with, okay, uh, but with, with the sense of fullest responsibility that this perception must change. You have to be specific. Okay. Have we collapsed as a system? Do we have regulatory mechanisms in place? Do we have a judicial system in place? Do we have an inquisitive and independent media in place or not? You were about the to say, to you were about to say yes. obnoxious, but you restrained <laughs> yourself as well. No, no, I won't all say right. that. Uh, Mr. But Mr. Sharma, you could argue whether the perception is right or wrong. I think what Nick is saying is that there is a shift yeah. in perception. Now, it's not, you can no, argue whether it's a correct shift or a wrong shift. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Kalani, let me ask you. When you interact with CEOs, because to be, to be honest, at Davos this year, when I walk around and I talk to a large number of people, I am also picking up that there is a shift in perception. Now, the minister is saying that's a wrong shift in perception. Maybe. But is there a shift in perception? Let's just come back to this question before we <coughs> return to yeah, let me Let me just say a few things on this. You know, yeah, there is a shift in perception, but the shift is not what you're all talking about. The shift in perception is that India has a large market. The GDP, even in the worst case, is growing by 7.5%. Uh, you know, there's a potential for the GDP to grow to eight, nine, and maybe even double digits if he, if he gets some of the things right. And therefore, most people in the Western world, especially in Europe, they are now looking at India, not how to sell products that they make in Europe in India, how to create new products for India. So they're looking at India very seriously. They're looking at investing in India very seriously. And that is the perception that we are seeing in Davos. Yeah, there are, you know, there are issues uh, like, you know, what, what uh, the minister just talked about. But I don't think uh, they, they weigh down uh, the opportunities that are available in India. I think there are, there are two or three things that need to be fixed, as, uh, you know, uh, my colleague has just talked about. Okay. Inflation, education, things like that. Barry, among experts, among the academic community, when you're, when you're looking at India, is there this change in perception, change in the way India is viewed? Or is it the normal up and down which comes when, when you're looking at any country over a prolonged growth phase? I, I don't know about academia. I think what people have said about the markets uh, is right. They swing from one extreme 
to the other, and that's why we're here to um, dissent from that. I would also dissent from the notion that India can grow by 7% if the rest of the world is only growing by 3 or slightly more than 3%. India is not going to be able to substitute domestic demand for the external demand that disappears. And the reason people are more worried about India in 2012 than they are about your run-of-the-mill emerging market is India has less scope for doing anything about this problem. China can roll out more infrastructure spending because it doesn't have big budget deficits. It can cut interest rates and reserve requirements on, on banks much more dramatically than the Reserve Bank can. Academics worry about India in the longer run uh, as well because they want to see higher savings and investment rates, which are coming but aren't here yet. India would be better off if it saved 40% of national income rather than 30%, and it would be better off if it uh, did a better job of delivering education more broadly. Those things are coming, but that's what academics concerned about medium-term prospects look at and worry about. So that is when, when we're coming, let's moving, moving back from perception to what could actually destabilize the Indian economy, especially if you do have a, a worsening of the global situation. Would it be those deficits that we are talking about right now, which would perhaps be the biggest cause of concern and which you at Standard & Poor's, for example, would be watching the most closely? Well, at, at Standard & Poor's, to look at the overall fiscal situation, the government situation, it's not any one single factor. It's, it's literally a very complex methodology and model which looks across quantitative factors, external balances, internal balances, monetary stability, the strength of the institutions that we've heard about which are stable and strong embedded in the country, the status of the capital markets, as well as issues of governance and, and political will. So th it's a very broad, very complex set of factors that you weigh across the board to come up with what is a current rating of, of, a, of with a stable uh, outlook on it. But there clearly are impacts in the global economy. There are, we are in a reality where whether you're in Brazil or China or India or other emerging markets that you are watching what's happening in the global economy and you have to be concerned about what the impact would be if there's a global slowdown. Okay. So Mr. Sharma, uh, I just want to come to you on the question of the deficits. And there's an internal fiscal deficit which is high which may mount further, especially as some of the new schemes that are being talked about in India, like food security and you know, job security, as they roll out, and there's nothing wrong with those schemes, but again, it puts pressure on the deficit. And then you have the potential for an external deficit, which is a problem which many other countries in Asia don't have to deal with. And that could run out of control, especially if oil prices shoot up. So, so is that what you would really worry about for the Indian economy? How do we do, deal with the deficits? I or think, are there other uh, causes for concern? All of us are worried particularly about the high commodity prices, also the increasing pressure on our trade account, on our current account. At the same time, <coughs> we are a country which is encouraging investments, which are national. And <coughs> look at the story. You have 22% average growth in rural consumption, particularly in the consumer goods. That is happening. Our economy, as Supachai has said, and you, that it is primarily driven by domestic demand and domestic production. At the same time, we are seeking to engage more with the world. In the last 11, 12 years, when you look at the integration of the Indian economy with the global economy, <clears throat> in percentage terms of our GDP, we have gone up almost three times from 44% to 120%. But yet, yes, we are a country which has systems and mechanisms in place to address those issues. But we won't allow any situation which runs out of control. But we also have to look at the social dimension. 1.2 billion, 17% of the world's population, 20% of the world's children. I would like to tell Ben that we are, for the last few years, investing in education a lot more than what we ever did. Investment in education has gone up fivefold. We have universalization of the primary education for the girl child now, even up to the universities, it has been made free. That is what we have uh, promised. Schools education was made free. Then we have the midday meal scheme. We, these are the schemes which you are referring to, which is retaining at least 120 million Indian children from poor backgrounds in schools, otherwise the dropout rate was high. 
job creation is not job security, but you are building community assets. It's what you believe in, austerity measures or spending. That's a, a debate for the economists. But what, during the Second World War, what Roosevelt did, whether the Keynesian model is right or Adam Smith's model is right, that's a different issue. But the fact is, if you do not have economic activity, if you do not provide sustainable incomes, then there can be a turbulence which is beyond any government's control. Then you can keep on analyzing, that will be a postmortem. So we need to spend, we need to empower our people, we need to educate them. We are, after India's independence, we created first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, barely few institutions, but very powerful, IITs, Indian Institutes of Management, Indian Institute of Science, Space Science, and nuclear science and all. Now we are more than doubling those institutions because we have the resources. Okay. Another thing what you said in my last word is, if we are creating wealth, we are redistributing wealth in India, which is empowering our people, bringing tens of millions of Indians out of the poverty line who are not part of the debates in Davos or the other discussions, but they are the people whom the in democracies, responsible governments have to address their needs too. Those challenges are paramount for us before we move forward to do something more. And we are trying to create, and we have to some extent, a knowledge-based and knowledge-led economy. All right. Nick, you want to say I something? Just, Vikram, you said, let's set aside perceptions. But I would say that's a dangerous thing to do, particularly when you're asking that question, is India immune? And you said from outside, and is it immune from itself? You could you think about the perceptions now of the Eurozone. Think about the perceptions of Latin America. Perceptions are critical, are a critical part of making judgments. And I put it to you, Minister, we haven't yet got back to something like the decision on multi-brand retailing. But when you make a decision, and then reverse it a few weeks later. People say, this is not the stability we need for investment. But on the other hand, when the court decides to uh, rule in Vodafone's favor, as it did a couple of weeks ago, that shifts the perception in another way. So I'm certainly not taking a view. I'm merely reporting to you what those outside say, including businessmen from abroad, saying, we notice a slowing down in contract negotiations. People are worried now in this corruption atmosphere, or anti-corruption atmosphere. They're worried about whether they dare sign even a contract at the moment because of the potential for there to be a backlash at some much. point in a court. I must quickly respond to you. First of all, when it comes to policy initiatives, we took considered view on multi-brand, single brand. Single brand, 100% FDI we have notified. Nobody, surprisingly, when you're talk, uh, talking of uh, assimilation of technologies, high-end Manufacturing has talked about one of the biggest policy rollouts which India has done in the last few months, that is the national manufacturing policy, which has huge objective of creating 100 million jobs, of creating integrated, self-contained, mega-industrial townships. I'm surprised that skeptics have not even looked at that or read that. And just to correct you, Nick, we in a democracy have to create a consensus. We, I thought we did. We did talk to all the stakeholders from farmers to consumers to industry. Cabinet took a decision in our system of government, like in Britain, these are executive decisions. Unfortunately, it got trapped in partisan politics. Now, in America, you have heard the phrase gridlock, nothing will move. Here, I can assure you, we said that we will have more consultations. It's a pause. We have the so word you are used to revive it. I'm, I'm just going no, to come we in have on that. not taken the, we are not going to roll back the decision. Question is, we will talk more, we are a union of states, and we are going to leave it. It will get notified, there's no question of a rollback. Okay, so Dunsk, I have to ask you this question, that at the end of the day, you refer to gridlock taking place in other countries as well. One of the things when you look at India is a certain sense of frustration at the fact that the political process or the gridlock between one party and the other is actually preventing India from doing all that it should be doing or it could be doing, and certainly, you know, decisions like this get, get, get held up. Is that something that is treated as being power for the course in a, in a democracy and something which people will just accept? Or at some point will there be a frustration that India just can't take decisions? Well, there would be always in a, in a democratic process there is a debate, there's a dialogue, there is a democracy that allows people to vote and 
have a dialogue. That's part of uh, a political process which is seen as, as healthy. And in a, a de democratic, capitalistic society, I think the debate and dialogue is always going to be healthy. If you don't mind, I'd like to introduce a slightly uh, view of one of the potential reasons why there is less business activity and less business confidence from outside. And that is because one of the biggest themes that we're seeing here in Davos is that there are, is a deleveraging of the banking system, especially in Europe and also in the U.S., there is a large, the large global corporations are sitting on top of very large stocks of cash with strong balance sheets, but there is a question about the overall level of confidence to make new investments, and a lot of different large corporations and banks and others are very inward looking with uh, trying to ensure that they are having their own house in order. So I would add a possibility for one of the other explanations for lack of, of business flow and business deals isn't because so people are not, not looking not India in India, specific. it's that there is a slower environment, a different level of confidence and much more inward looking going on. Barry, you you to asked say how um, S&P reacts to dysfunctional politics we know in the United States, <laughs> having, having learned in August. Um, I agree with the point about the banks, but it's not only foreign banks. Uh, if I would add uh, one more word about 2012, it would be watch India's banks as well. We know that sharp slowdowns remain sharp slowdowns when a country has a robust banking system. And the way they always turn into something worse is when they're allowed to infect the banks. Um, I think India has a, a relatively well-regulated banking system by uh, emerging market standards. It's tempting to say by the standards of the United States as well. But 2012 will be a test. Non-performing loans will go up and we'll, that stress test will tell us exactly how well regulated the banks are. Okay. Baba Kalyani, when India Inc. and others are looking at the situation, I think they are also talking largely at the, what seems to be the gridlock, the inability of the government to govern, the inability of decisions to be taken, a certain fear psychosis also setting in in parts of the government because of the corruption scandals. Is that what is really concerning you, that the decisions aren't getting taken and being taken fast enough? You know, I think there is some ground reality to, uh, uh, to what you say in terms of decision-making process. And I think uh, Mr. Minister Anand Sharma uh, very well put it in terms of uh, the political status that we have in a democracy. Yeah, it, it affects business. I mean, I would, I would not be the one who say it doesn't affect business. But uh, let's understand, you know, India has many different uh, activities as far as businesses are concerned. And you will find that almost 75% of business activities in India are at record levels in 2011-12. You look at the profits of companies, you look at their top line, you look at their bottom line, you look at the growth uh, that they're planning in 2012-13, it's at record levels. Within the country or outside? No, Some within the country. Outside. Within the country. So, and that is, that is because we are growing, you know, and the economy is growing, you know, it's not contracting. And if you look at our economy in PPP terms, you know, price purchase parity terms, I think Asia now accounts for close to between 45 and 50 percent of world GDP. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's not lose sight of that. Yeah, there are issues. We have structural issues. He's very right. You know, the banking system can get stressed uh, when there is a downturn. You have, in an economy, large growth programs going on, therefore large investments, and if there is a slowdown, it has an impact. Right. Dr. Sapachai, how do you deal with the problems of not being able to get good enough governance? Is that something that worries you or concerns you? Uh, yes. Uh, we place uh, normally good governance as uh, very high on the priority of countries that can really determine their own development strategy. But in the case of India, uh, and, and as many countries, emerging countries, when we see rapid growth taking place, uh, we will also tend to notice that uh, accompanying this growth, there will be increasing level of uh, disparity, inequality, increasing level of uh, maybe of, uh, of practices that are not really uh, transparent. But I would cite one example for India, which is uh, maybe helpful because I think uh, Nick was right in trying to 
uh, portray the kind of perception for India because if you look at India, I just love the press in India because they are one of the most open and free. You, you read articles in Indian press and, and you have to be happy because they write about anything, everything. They criticize everyone. <laughs> you, so uh, I'm, not you, sure, you, I'm not sure the minister necessarily agrees with you <laughs> no, on that. No, but, no, no I but, do. I do. But, but because yeah. of this free press and, 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 and frank uh, expression of opinion, you see all kind of uh, perceptions coming out in, of, of India as well. You know, the, way, the way things are blown up because of the free press which is a good thing, but it gives uh, some perception. The, the National uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is, I think, a highlight of what the government has been courageous to do, and at the UN we really praise this program a lot, is full of loopholes. I mean, there has been cases of corruption yes, yes, yes. Uh, in Haraina, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, in Orissa, but in all these cases, I have noticed, because we follow from the, from the UN side, the Indian government has always sent in investigators you send in the Central Bureau of Investigation, yes. they're yes. all investigated. In some areas, thousands of people are fired, I think are laid off, the officials, because there has been some misreporting of the, of the fund. So I would say that, you know, together with the growth path that India is growing, and you look at other countries in Asia as well, you would see accompanying misappropriation of the funds. But it, it matters the, uh, the most uh, whether you really take care of it or you just leave it like that. You have to be able to take people to task and penalize them. And that, that is, a, uh, I think, decising, uh, decide, decisive uh, uh, factor to, to say whether this is a good or not uh, government. Okay, Nick? Just for fear that the minister might be making the wrong judgment about what I was saying, which was reporting the views of others. Yeah. This perception issue works both ways. I come from a country where Indian money, Indian corporations have saved businesses big businesses like Jaguar Land Rover. They've revitalized the auto industry in the Midlands. They've just bought, SR has just bought the Stanlow oil refinery for a knockdown price because no one else wanted to buy it. So they are maintaining the refining capacity currently within the United Kingdom. These are companies which are rich, they've got a lot of cash, and they're going out and projecting India. And one of the discussions I've had often at the um, CII and elsewhere is why India isn't more self-assertive about making sure people realize it's India that's saving a lot of businesses which are actually in, in, in doubt at the moment. And that's probably true in Africa as well, the largest number of, uh, of areas in Africa yes. where India is now starting to move in. But Baba Kalyani, is that also a cause for some concern that many Indian industrialists seem to be finding better opportunities outside the country than inside? <coughs> no, I don't think it's a cause for concern. I think it's a, it's a natural way for Indian companies to grow. I mean, it's a natural way where most businesses have grown in the past uh, 50 odd years. Uh, so I think you're now beginning to see Indian multinationals. You know, the, the concept in India was a multinational has to be necessarily out of Europe or North America. You know, I think that's changing and that's good. That's good for India and as I agree with Nick. You know, I think we just need to be a little more self-assertive about the good things that we are doing. Okay, so let me now come and put a slightly broader question to all of you. Now, whatever may happen this year, next year, I've heard in the last two or three days some comments which are almost certainly too gloomy, Minister, saying, oh, you know, the India story may well all be over. It will, we are flattered to deceive, and now we are back to where it's we are. It's very well intact. It will remain intact. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to ask you, looking ahead now, next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years, where do you see the India growth story rolling out? What are the balance of probabilities, and what perhaps needs to be done to make sure it stays on track? If I could start with you, Barry, and then go in this direction. Well, uh, I'll stick with my 8% um, a year growth, 5 years, 10 years. Uh, and, and Hang on, you're saying 5 to 10 years no, of 8% growth from I, now on? I onwards. think India can, can grow for a decade or possibly two by 8% a year if it gets everything right. But getting everything that's, right, that's, I think that's the, the upper bound for a dynamic emerging market in a troubled world. But that requires sound policies. That requires having a buffer against external shocks, which India doesn't have at the moment. It will require raising savings and investment rates. And I'll add one more item to the list. India needs to grow manufacturing employment faster than it has. So um, services are a wonderful success story for India. Those big corporations with their foreign presence are a success story as well. But it, you know, Indian manufacturing employment, as we all know, hasn't been growing at the rate of Chinese manufacturing 
employment. And if that's the target you're aiming at close to Chinese growth rates, you've got to grow domestic manufacturing employment at close to Chinese rates. Nick Kang, what's the India story for the next two decades? I think all the fundamentals are there. I would put to you, we're now two and three quarter years into the current government, and it could be that opportunities have been missed. You're now moving into a, a critical election cycle with the UP election and then uh, eventually the national election. And I would put to you, Minister, that that in its own way could begin to constrain, particularly after the wobbles that you had following the, the 2G scandal when it became difficult for the coalition. And therefore, the fundamentals are there, but you know Indian politics. These could easily uh, be a problem when it comes to how this is handled by your government, by the, by the state governments, and by the chief ministers, because this has now become a very complex political process, and there are those who say that you could squander the political advantages you've got up to now. Right, Baba Kalyani? Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with Barry. Uh, I believe that India will grow uh, close to 8%. And you know, you have to understand India's growth uh, is relative. If uh, Europe rebounds, if North America rebounds, our growth will be even higher. You know, and if it doesn't, then it will be somewhere in the 7 to 8 percent kind of range. What that means is that by 2020, you will be a $7 trillion economy, a very, very large economy. And, you know, what we have done in the last 60 years, uh, we will do three times of that in the next 10 years. Yeah, there are challenges. We have had bigger challenges in the past. You know, 1991 wasn't too long back. And I think uh, the leadership, uh, the system was able to, uh, you know, make things work. And I, I'm very optimistic that uh, you know, India will reach its goal. Is there anything at all that you think could happen which would not allow that to happen, kicks you back to 3 4 percent? You know, I think Ind Indian economy now runs on market forces. It doesn't run on politics. It doesn't run on, you know, uh, the parliament or whatever it is. They make policy, yes, but the economy runs on market forces. And I think in the future, as the economy grows, it will be more market forces that will drive the economy and drive political decision making rather than anything else. All right, Dr. put on your thinking cap the next yes, 20 and years. India more likely to be AAA or more likely to be triple C? <laughs> more likely to be improving, but let me uh, reflect on one of the big themes that was here at Davos, which if I project out 20, 30 years, one of the most important topics we had discussions on is social protection. And in meetings with advanced economies, very developed economies and others, there is a critical opportunity for India right now to look at its policy on pensions and health care. There are what some would call a demographic dividend with having 65 percent of the population under 35 years old. And that is, that's an opportunity, but it's also a risk if those policies are not looked at today and you don't have the right level of savings, the right level of pension systems, the right kind of health care. And so I do think that that will be a very important factor because we see today in developed economies with the demographic uh, demographic cost starting to take place, they are seeing increases in their fiscal deficits and they have less and less flexibility. So I, I put that on the table as I, I agree with these projections of growth. I think the conditions are there, but I do think in the theme of Davos, we need to look at social protection, make sure that that's being looked at today and not wait for 30 years. Mr. Minister? Your prognosis and to what extent does this depend eventually on politics? Just quickly. Including, I dare say, who wins the next election. Just quickly. Uh, the investment while budgetary allocation for health and education have gone up sevenfold and fivefold in the last seven years. Because we have been able to generate resources and redistribute, because we believe as a philosophy that if you do not redistribute or reinvest, it is a zero sum game. Secondly, even going by what Ben was saying, 8%, I'm sure I remain optimistic we'll grow. Because the fundamentals are strong, we're not going to end up in a situation where we'll slip. I have faith in our people, especially the younger people whom we are seeking to empower. It's not an issue of education and creating opportunities. India is and shall remain a land of limitless opportunities. Third is the shift in the world, the rebalancing of the world order, economic and political. The sh shift has been towards the East and to Asia. The fact remains that by all analysts and pundits, I am not one of them. I have been a political activist for all my life. But I'm 
educated in university, so I tried to understand and, and read. At the same time, in two years, less than two years from now, the economies of Asia, European Union and America will be exactly equal sized. And within this decade, maybe eight years from now, the, of the first five economies of the world, without any dispute, nobody is contesting that, will be from Asia in whatever order, China, India, Japan, or China, Japan, India. So we are not going to be a lost case at all. At the same time, in democracies, the benefit is that the governments are accountable. It's not, Vikram, what you think that I think about the media. Media, no freedom comes without a sense of responsibility, even the fundamental rights of a citizen. That has to be borne in mind while informing and while debating. At the same time, how can the Republic of India question that freedom when the first famous editor during the colonial times when we were not independent people was none other than Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the father of the Indian Republic? <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> and That's lastly, one yes. comment I must make about I don't believe in taking names of individuals. Nick, you talked about elections. We have voting in few of the provinces day after. And Uttar Pradesh, which is 196 million people, you and me will meet. I'm confident we will win these elections. Well, all right. We'll, okay. we'll leave and the politics. I, I mean that. We'll leave it's the not politics. politics. It's, it's, you, you will see, and that's why I say, let's meet. Okay. And let this audience remember what we I will, have said. We will we are no doubt going be to discussing. wither away because of one reason. Mm -hmm. on, because of one reason. When it was a question of whether India will win independence or not, whether Mahatma Gandhi was right or not, Gandhi never wanted any global prize or Nobel prize. He was against his wish and knowledge, nominated for a Nobel prize, but a counter nomination was filed for a person called Lord Chelwood. Lord Chelwood got the Nobel prize and the citation read, do you, any of you remember Lord Chelwood? The citation read, it's a Nobel prize, peace prize, that he led a demonstration of 13 people in Trafalgar Square for peace. All right, there you are. So the, right, I don't Dr. know Zubhaja. my name to demonstrate. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Uh, I, I would say that uh, India is, is not going away. I mean, uh, India is still around. And uh, what is happening to India this year, uh, I would uh, describe it as a pause. It's not really that India is moving backward. It, it's just a pause. It's a pause that is needed because a country that has been moving so fast forward will need some time to, to, to consolidate. And this is a good time for India to be consolidating because the, the, the rising prices and everything, India will have to cope with. But there are three basic uh, uh, assumptions that I, that I would like to, uh, to relay to you that would actually indicate how much India can come back. The first one is that, as I said from the beginning, India has run out of the, uh, the capacity that has been produced by the early reforms in the 1990s. So now it's a new round. If, this is an inflection point for India. India will have to go back again and look at the banking system, the power use, uh, the infrastructure, particularly the roads. The aviation, you've done very well. Uh, Anand, uh, aviation, you go and into all these small towns in India, you have a lot of new airports and things like that. You have to do a better job also now for the future, and as true with all the Asian economies, to get over the middle uh, income trap, which is to invest as much as possible into R&D. And also, at the same time, I would certainly encourage Anand to go ahead. He's, uh, when I was in India, he was announcing the, uh, the courageous uh, move to liberalize the retail sector. I would encourage the Indian government to go ahead with it. Uh, I've seen Thailand in my own time. We've done, we've done the same thing. Uh, I got a lot of criticism in the parliament, but now 10 years on, even the moms and pop stores are making use of the supermarkets, you know, to buy the things and then sell, sell the things so in the corner stores. Invite him to India to talk to the yes, opposition. <laughs> so but the are you going thing, to take him up on getting it done? Yeah, so? yes, yes. that's done. It's a pause. Yes. Okay. So you you know, if you read Oxford and Chambers' dictionary, what's the meaning of the word temporary suspension? Okay, so, it's so, 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 so the first set is to, to go and to do a new round of reform. The second uh, condition is the, uh, we we'll always be saying that India has been actually benefiting so much from the prevalence of the services sector. Now the question for the next round is that how we can bring the benefits of the, of the rise of the service sector in India, particularly the IT industry, to bear upon the productivity in the manufacturing sector. That is the key. You okay. have to link that up, and then you can gain, again, another round of productive increase that will drive up the income. And the last point is, I think India should be more integrated to the global economy. 
but not really to the global really as such, but first through East Asia. Because this is where India could be naturally linked to. And as India is now trading, uh, you know, China is the largest trading partner with India. Uh, India should be trading more in, in Asia to be more integrated in, in terms of the... Uh, just, a, just a quick intervention. Of the 750 billion merchandise trade in 2011, 330 billion is in Asia. All right. So that's, the, before, that's the shift which is taking place. Before I turn to the audience, I'm just trying to get a, get a commitment from you, Minister. When are you lifting the pause button or pressing it again? Listen, don't ask me uh, After the a UK question. election? No, it will happen. That I assure you. And the pause cannot be too long because, you know, when, whatever you are doing, what I would like to say, the government has said we will have again a round of consultation, but we will not reverse the decision. We will try to have more consensus. Consensus does not mean unanimity. It must never be confused. That's my urging to our political opponents. The government in power takes executive decisions. Bipartisan consensus should be there. If you ideologically or philosophically are opposed to it, when people vote you back, you can reverse that. But as long as we are in government, we will do what is correct, what is right, what is in India's good. All right, so we shall be waiting for that. On that note, let me now turn to the audience and see if I can get some, some questions. Gentlemen there, very last row. Uh, hello, my name is Chandra Naya from Hong Kong. Um, I'm a bit puzzled that uh, we've had discussions about growth will carry on for 8 10% for 20 years, etc. India will become a $10 trillion economy, etc. Uh, but maybe it's Davos, but I've not heard anyone mention that there'll be any resource constraints, limits, etc. Uh, am I being naive, or is this denial on the part of the general sort of growth endlessly will take place in a country with 1.2 billion, billion people? Surely there must be constraints in terms of resources. And to add to that, and I hope the minister will not slap me now, but surely Gandhi G. I'm, 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 I'm hoping Look for that. for other political leaders <laughs> who believe in talking of slaps. Okay. And but, I meant metaphorically. So sorry. No, we have. <laughs> I don't believe in that. I'm but, by conviction but, a but, Gandhian. But I, I'm sure Gandhi also would be very pleased if uh, the consumption would be of a nature where the majority of Indians will have homes and, most importantly, toilets. But is, your, is it your point that India shouldn't grow at 8% for the next 20 years? the same people who end up questioning us on right to food security and to create, pay for employment no. to the poor people. No, no, I'm my, not talking of you as an individual. I'm not arguing the point. I'm just saying I suspect that food security may not be achieved if we carry on. That is what your thinking is. is okay, my fine. Is there, is there, should there be a resource constraint in allowing India to grow at 8% or at the end of the day, can the lack of resources really prevent a country from rising? As an economic historian, I can tell you that people have been worrying about this for 200 years, claiming that resource constraints will, will stifle economic growth. They are a factor that prevents growth from exceeding 8% in a country like India. 20 years from now, when Indian growth begins to decelerate, we will have come a long way in terms of solar power, in terms of the efficiency of salt water uh, purification and in, in other ways of relaxing resource constraints. All right, the lady here. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Marla Nimhara, and uh, I'm a social activist from India. Um, this is where in Davos, and just to bring a couple of uh, reflections from actually what we've been talking about over the last three or four days here in Davos. One of the themes has already been mentioned, the great transformation. The other themes are to do with new models, new business models, and also recognizing that we are living at a time of a massive shift in demographics and the importance of recognizing that and diversity. So just in terms of two of those aspects of that, youth and gender, I would have liked to see the panel reflect young people's voices, and I would like to have seen women on the panel. Missed opportunity, but certainly recommendation for next time. Now more to the theme of the discussion, and that really is the immunity. How immune is India? When a physician looks at the immunity of a patient, they look at how resilient is the patient. 
Now, all of the esteemed contributors have been talking about only one aspect of the resilience, and that's the economic, the monetary, the fiscal aspects of resilience. The other aspects of resilience is human development and environmental development. And on both of those indicators, we are ashamedly at the bottom of the pile, 134 in the Human Development Index and 124 on the Environmental Performance Index. All right. Let's not continue this belligerent defensiveness about what we have on the debit side. Let's just talk about how we can, in a more mature way, advance ourselves in conversation with the best practice right. outside as well as internally. All right. Let me get some more comments. The gentleman here in the first row. Ugo Tramballi, Sole 24 Ore, which is the Italian equivalent of Indian Economic Times. <clears throat> Let me come back to the corruption. Of course, we now we produce a wonderful uh, uh, central bank government, wonderful prime minister, but still as Italian, we have some uh, outstanding expertise on, uh, on corruption. Um, when you talk about corruption in India, is uh, because of free press that in any other part of, of India does exist, as in, in, uh, in, in Asia does exist, does exist like in India, or the corruption is very spreading in India, the level of corruption is very dangerous for, for the civil society of the country. Okay, let me get some more comments and I'll try and come back to the panel to see if anybody wants to respond to them. The lady in the very last row. Thank you. This is Chen from China. Ms. Christine Lagarde just said that no country is immune from the situation in Europe. And, uh, in the, in the financial markets, we, uh, the investors really focus on what's S&P's actions. And Douglas, I want to know that, is there any further reactions you will take on the Euro, Euro zone? Because that will impact the global financial market and the India one. Thank you. All right. Um, let me see if I can get one more comment. The gentleman here. It's just an observation in the spirit of debate uh, for the minister. Uh, observation from having done business around the world for many years, what strikes you most about India is some of the smartest businessmen in the world, one of the most dysfunctional governments. Government officials at all these public forums take remarkable credit for the growth of the country, which has been delivered by smart and risk-taking businessmen despite the government. So I would propose why wouldn't the government hold itself accountable and measure itself on the things it's supposed to de deliver, which is metrics on healthcare, it education, and infrastructure. Time to respond. And you know, the, 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 the private industry will take care of the rest of it. OK, I think I'm going to get you to respond to that. Then we probably have to end the panel there, because I think we're flat out of time. You see, I can only say. Dysfunctional government and smart businessmen. Is that a listen, fair way to uh, sum up? Thank things? you for the verdict. We have 750 million voters. I go by their verdict. Secondly, you have been less than charitable, some of us. I would wait to see, earlier comments also, when social activists from India have enough resources to come to Davos and say the same, make the same statement about India. I would have appreciated if you had acknowledged that farmer loans were waived off, 100 days of employment is a constitutional right, right to education is a constitutional right, right to information is a constitutional right, food security will be a constitutional right. I fail to understand that why the positives are just trashed and only a negative story, which is not correct. We are okay. not the governments. When you say that despite the government, I'm extremely sorry to say, in no democracy in the world, you won't be voting in your country if you don't believe either in a political party, its philosophy, its ideology. And okay. if they are not accountable, you won't vote them out. What is accountability in a democracy? It's the people's court. All right, I think we are flat out of time. Maybe five seconds if you want to sum up, uh, Douglas, after that. I think that this has been a very lively debate. And being here in... <laughs> you could say that again. Yes, yeah, but being here in Davos, I, I appreciate that we've been able to stop just focusing on Europe and come back and talk about India. Okay. You're you going to start a fight again, Nick, in just five more little, seconds? A just a little vignette. When you go to Del Isle Street, when you go up into the, into the tower block of the stock exchange, when you then go to some of the merchant areas of Mumbai, you can feel why India is not immune from the rest of the world. And it is a difficult time for India in that sense, whether you're a small vegetable seller or you're a stockbroker up in one of those towers or the new stock exchange. It's very different from 2008 when you had the banking system which was in place. So the answer to your question is, no, it's not immune, India, from the rest okay. of the world. Dr. Subhashar, I'm going to give the final line to you. 
Well, I, I would say that this is really the time of in, uh, for, for, for inflection for, for India. And uh, India must take courage uh, from the past dynamism that India has actually achieved. Uh, this is not building on, on nothing. India is going to build on the strong fundamentals, strong. Uh, granted that there will be certain def deficiencies that India will have to work on, but I think I, I look forward to, to India not really gone away, but uh, building on what India has achieved and, and, and achieve much further than this in the, in the near future. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us for what was just described as a lively panel. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And that's it for now from the World Economic Forum at Davos. Thanks for watching. Thank you.